Well, there's the question of how does the brain work, which is kind of the last frontier of science, really. I just think that's that's fascinating, and you know the the uh, the potential applications are enormous, in the sense that we could go back to a leisure society without having to have slaves. You know, the robots could do all the work. So that's that's a tremendous sort of that tremendous way. thing. And then the pot potential to heart just couple our brains with super intelligences and take ourselves to the next level of intelligence and capability. The possibilities are just endless. So I think it has a lot of practical uses and it has a, uh, it's just a fascinating topic as well. Yeah. So yeah, uh, what is the singularity? What, what do you mean? What, what do you think people mean when they say the singularity related to progress in AI? As progress continues, it will reach a point potentially where things become so different and the capabilities of the computers and enhanced people become so great that we can't really predict what will happen beyond a certain point. I mean, it's very hard to predict the future of a society, even at the best of times, but in that scenario, we are going to have no idea what would happen. It would be like um, early hominids trying to speculate about what, would, what our society would look like. They would just have no idea. So I think that's the singularity. It doesn't necessarily require an exponential... A continual exponential growth in computer power or anything, it just requires things reaching a certain point where things are so different that we can't predict what's going to happen. So it's that sort of radical uncertainty. We don't know what, what our role would be in that future, for example, if we have a role at all. Yeah. singularity idea goes mainstream or well, once it reaches a critical mass in society and people believe it well, how do you think they'll actually react the, the general populace will be knee jerk or do you think we're going to have enough time to sort of nurture people into the idea of you know radical smart AIs I think it'll be very difficult for that ideas of singularity to go into the general population because in a way they're so abstract and therefore probably a lot of people would have trouble with them. I think it's more likely we're going to see a lot of focus on sort of practical issues like automation, unemployment, um, potentially medical progress, ability to uh, defer death indefinitely and to, to continue healthy life indefinitely. And there's already been a fair bit of opposition to this idea. Aubrey de Grey's talked about you know, people get actually quite upset about the idea of living indefinitely uh, because it kind of contradicts a lot of religious ideas, for example, and the fact that people have reconciled themselves to death and now you're raising this issue again that I thought I'd kind of got, gotten used to. So I think it's probably going to come up as more practical, immediate concerns and people will probably react in a knee-jerk sort of reaction. Um, so, like, idea, I mean, the sort of things that I find very appealing, you know, the ability to, say, take a computer, plug it into your brain and massively enhance yourself, I think, a lot of, um, I think it's going to take a long time to, for people to get used to that idea until perhaps they actually see it. Uh, but, you know, these abstract ideas, the, the singularity is a point beyond which we cannot see I don't see that ever gaining much currency in, in the population at large. What kinds of AI do you think are likely to contribute to the style of artificial intelligence which may um, sort of bootstrap a singularity? Well, I don't know that we really understand what a final, you know, the ultimate AI is going to look like. You know, we're still getting breakthroughs on you know each decade with things like deep learning and HTM and so forth. Computer power is growing exponentially, so I don't think we know what the final form will look like. Um, I, 
having read Ben Gertzel's book, I think, I think he's right that it will probably be, need to be some sort of hybrid of techniques. You know, there's this no free lunch theorem which says that there's no one algorithm which is best in every situation. So it's probably going to have to be some pastiche or hybrid of different things like symbolic reasoning, uh, low-level optimization, you know, feature extraction, etc., etc. So I think it'll be some sort of pastiche, but I don't think we have all the elements yet. We just don't have computers that are powerful enough probably even to test the algorithms uh, that are going to come up. So I think that's, this is another thing that we just don't know. What are the motivations that are likely to cause people to work towards a, you know, a super intelligent AI? There's very few people working on that specifically. So I think most of the progress, as you suggested before, relate will probably come from side effects of other work. People are trying to work out the mindset of consumers more accurately, or uh, say someone wants to go through medical journals and find, discover stuff or someone wants to analyse the genome and relate it to proteomics and all this sort of thing. And so the, uh, these techniques, plus you know, the continuing push for more and more powerful computers, <laughs> driven by graphics, you know, realistic simulations, all those sort of things, as a side effect you get closer and closer to general AI, I think. But uh, the people who are actually pushing for general AI superintelligence as such are very small in number, uh, I think. So uh, it'll come about more as a side effect. And just like you see in medicine, it's one of the deceptive things about progress generally through, through towards a singularity is that you d um, people see progress in their own field, but often things come in from the side. I was talking about a, a medicine where for example, imaging technology has come, come ahead in enormous leaps and bounds and that's transformed a lot of diagnostic processes. And similarly, uh, and gen uh, genome research has, has made a big difference to, for example, tr cancer treatments. They can tell whether drugs are going to work on someone without even trying them, that sort of thing. Uh, robotic surgery, mi you know, microsurgery, etc. Et so these sort of general techniques come in from the side and people working in a particular field of surgery can then exploit them. So it's these sort of cross-fertilisations that I think can be very, very important. And so the whole enterprise moves forward at a faster rate than any individual part would on its own. John Searle does a great service with his Chinese room argument because it really shows there's something we haven't worked out about consciousness, qualia, etc. I think that's very useful. But then he takes it another level further and, and tries to turn it into an impossibility proof of machines or computers having consciousness. And I think his proof fails because it's really a, it's a shallow verbal argument which says computers can only do syntax, minds have semantics, and you can't do semantics with syntax. But I think that's just sort of playing with words, so that's, that's really my disappointment with him. If, if, if a, 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 a human brain which consists of atoms can produce consciousness, etc., as Searle admits, he doesn't think there's any magic secret source or quantum thing. He thinks it's atoms producing this. And what do atoms do? They obey the laws of physics, they just do mechanical things which you can see of as syntax and out of that comes consciousness. So I don't see any fundamental argument as to why silicon computers can't do exactly the same thing. And what's sort of missing, one thing that's missing from his Chinese room argument is that he says the person just follows instructions to turn the questions into answers. But you don't just follow instructions in an algorithm, you have all this data that you gather which is states, and these states really represent awareness of things, i.e. consciousness. So I, I think the Chinese room is conscious, because if you're, his Chinese rooms, this one person is trying to simulate a human brain, and if you work out the mechanics of that, um, 
it would be more than the life of the universe to just read one character. So in that sense it wouldn't be conscious because it would just be so slow you wouldn't it wouldn't be able to read a single sentence in, in before the heat death of the universe. So that's my, my thoughts on that. But I think the Chinese room argument is a, it does point out a problem that needs to be solved, but I don't think it's an impossibility proof. The problem is uh, how can consciousness exist? Because it seems to be a mental thing. How can mental things exist in a purely physical world? How can sensation, you know, the blueness of blue or whatever, the feeling of pain, intentionality, how can all that exist in a world of just causal relationships between uh, particles and fields? Uh, I think Dennett actually makes a good argument as to one of, one of Searle's arguments is that uh, you cannot have intentionality or meaning without a, a brain. But Dennett, I think, explains how that can work because evolution and our minds extract meaning out of the regularities of the world and the meaning really comes from the regularities of the world and our mind kind of reflects that. So I don't think there's anything uh, conclusive about that argument. So what you have here is sedimentary rocks, which is you know, basically sand that's been laid down over a period of time, compressed, solidified into rock and then uplifted. And then it's been eroded away to produce this plateau, which is where you know, Katoomba and Lura are, and then these deep valleys. But it's only a few hundred million years old, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of fossils in it, so it's not really that significant geologically. In terms of Australia, the most interesting stuff geologically is over in the west where you've got these very old rocks of billions of years old. 